Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Charlie Legere, and uh, along with Jeffrey O'Brien, I'm one of the co-curators of the series. Um, this is our third reading of the semester, and uh, we're honored to welcome A.B. Spellman. And there are two more readings this semester, which I'm going to announce when they are. Cyrus Consul is on April 2nd, and Ariana Rains is on April 23rd. You should keep your eyes out for that. I also want to announce there are um, two conferences that are coming up that are both, in a way, poetry related. One of them starts tomorrow. And uh, the poster for it is right outside the door. The name is slipping my mind right now. Um, it's hosted in part by the Interdisciplinary Marxist Working Group. And I think there's a poetry reading that is related to it. And then the other one is called Medium and Margin. And that's hosted by Mia Yu and Colin Dingler and Lynn Hijinian. And they're bringing Barrett Watton and uh, Steve Benson and Dee Morris all to campus. That's on March 13th and 14th. I will give you tonight's lineup, and then I'll get out of the way. First up, we're going to have the, an English PhD student and a poet who's already read, actually, this semester in the series named Rebecca Gatos, who's going to introduce our graduate student poet tonight, uh, Nikhil, uh, did I say it wrong? I practiced, but I, uh, Nikhil Govind, who is a PhD student in South and Southeast Asian Studies. And then Emeritus Professor Ishmael Reed is going to introduce A.B. Spellman. So, and then after the reading, we're going to have a brief Q&A if you have any questions. And uh, you can pick up copies of AB's books from the Cal Student Store up front here. So please join me in welcoming tonight's readers. Hello. Um, it's my pleasure to be introducing Nikhil Govin tonight. I met Nikhil last semester when we were both taking Cecil Giscombe's poetry workshop. And Cecil can't be here tonight, but he sends his greetings from the Midwest. Although he's sorry to miss the reading, he was fortunate to hear and meet A.B. Spellman at his luggage door gallery reading in San Francisco, and to have been able to work with Nikhil Govind in a graduate seminar. Cecil has asked me to read the following warning. I'd warn the audience that Nikhil Govin's vision is dark. And I'd warn you, too, that his work is comic. The writing has other wondrous parts as well, but this morning I'm thinking of those two elements and the way that they intertwine in the poems. In the most dire of the poems are lines that ring with the kind of wry dismissiveness that makes us laugh, or almost laugh, against our will. Likewise, the comically absurd moments in Nikhil Govin's poems are edged with a recognition of doom. He sighs exquisitely, new pain of an old love, new name for an old pain, new nerve for an old pain. I'd suggest that we take Cecil's warning to heart. Nikhil's poetry is uncomfortable. It blurs the distinction between affirmation and despair. Nikhil writes, it is my duty to misconceive, to abort, to recite the cadence of the ocean. In Nikhil's poetry, death and suffering are what they are, a big deal and no big deal. When he's not ruminating on the seam of death or describing blood flummed yellow, he's inhabiting the poetical, the flowery, or even approaching the ornamental. He gives rein to the aesthetic and to the flatness or the unlikeliness of poetry's success. His poems are not about development. They do not cohere. Rather, Nikhil finds images and phrases that resist synthesis. If the images do hang together, it is insofar as they suggest a mood. Nikhil's poems give up poetry's claim to self-importance. It is not the poems themselves that are important. It is their afterlife, the way emotion and sound linger. Nikhil grew up in India and came to the US in 2004. He is a graduate student in UC Berkeley's South Asia department, where he's writing a dissertation on Hindi modernist poetry. Nikhil's poetry almost has a place. But if it is in the Himalayas, he is quick to remind us that it is the Himalayas of now. If his poetry has a language, perhaps it is the English language. But English, as the, self -con uh, as the self conscious confrontation of the written and the spoken, where the sound of speech creeps into print, where status itself gets loose, and we recognize the implications of hearing. Please welcome Nikhil. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Kettle drums and wrestler, elephant and elephant keeper, tighten your waistband, fasten your curly locks, voice deep from the throat of clouds, I will send you to the home of death. Sovereign of elephants, seized him by his trunk, slipping the hold, darting between pillars of feet. The elephant smells the sweat, he slips free, grasping him by his tail as an eagle, a snake, dodging left, right, mid, twirl of hips as boy with calf, then suddenly forward, wham, on the head, and still more faints and more and hits by now furious, gashed, elephant, a final gore with its tusk lips, blood flamed yellow, each separate tooth goaded. But he lifts him by the trunk, hurls him to the ground, stepping like a lion, he tears the tusk and then also breaks the skull of the elephant keeper, holding tusk as ripened fingernail, aloft as trophy he enters, rut and further elephant fluid on his muscle, lotus faced. Okay. Um, silken sleepwear and matching Irish wolfhounds. All decent folk have taken to wearing merkins. The skin, an invisible skin tight garment, she comes to soon. The mother's rough tongue traces Rococo as a frightened sea creature. A roar, and it was over, as of a birth. Lackluster coat, fading firmness, water mixtures. 250 pounds and not muscle either, nor anything that wrinkles easily. An evening of arms and damp, and damp wool sweaters. Stop it a little harder. Peach textured fingertips, a sooty chill on my upper lip, a crocodile of tired girls, and with a rose gold blotter waiting in my fingers, an opened crush, clabbered nerves, accents choked in syrup, a pulse in the hollow of a far collarbone, de a deliquescence of propped on pillows, worn and quiet and an heirloom silver in rooms of chintz, pinning rosettes on horses. The romance and the voyeur of the romance are one, and flowering fat and loam. Okay. Oh. This skull collapses in the palms to gold dust. This word is not worth the breath it consumes. Only a handful of earth is needed to cover this copse, and there are mountains all around. Empty desert cisterns lie piled high in mangle. I dig graves for one, two, seven, but how many? Six months naked in the desert, walking behind the horses, in abandoned railway keys and yards closeted with the gun's machine fire. Empire is yet warm in its ash. Okay. This poem's called No More Buddhas. <coughs> Sitting upside down, speeding downward, underwater, deep in emerald, miniature legs, scissoring a blemished dream grain, shearing the licorice surface, scattering Fishworm eyes, these six arms limp, unwaving, aniconic, a brain lost in some damp interior gut. No myth, nor metaphor, nor language, no art can save this undeft, clumsy enlightenment, this awakening. Okay. Okay. This thread of continuous stream Mountain monasteries, hymn air timbers, the temple bells chafe, straits unbelittled, stretched out skyness, hunting the self of the self. I feed these marigolds to the ocean, flower and wood for pyres, the smudge of distance. My duty is to misconceive, to abort, to recite the cadence of the ocean. 
Migrating words read the wave wrinkles like an ancient script. Every weakness and sacrifice is unaccompanied. Not a clean fish gasp of death, but the thief step of the hours, rebirths, the seam of death and deaths. Okay, and this is the last one. Uh, these are from the Buddha Suicides. That's the title. Each of 101 Buddha names on grains of rice, sugar for the dead. Each time rebuilt, each time destroyed, bone by bone. This temple's wood is made of bone. You cannot find God with candles in a cave. The spirit is a renunciant of the grave, the idol of the nave. A forest in a grain of rice, camphor in a fold of palm. Who is this that wowed destruction? This king or that other one or that other one's son? Did one forget to tell you that the war was over before you were born? One, the mute corpse. The other, the lyricist of meaning. Bodies of your foremothers hang upside down in the square near the temple. Obscure must be this idol's gifts. For everything f happened first here long ago, many times, over and over. In the night's rain, in the bullock cart, in a landscape moving, unappeasing. Where there was a tribe, an order, and way of life, now there are grain merchants with a giant plaque commemorating the tribe and the way of life and order. As one goes further into the watercolors mountains, one gets nearer the goats of the valley where the grain rain toils with the conversation and the chanting. Mnemonic, mnemonic of rain water patter, the inner of the foreclosed hour, where what is unsaid is more. Prince of camphored flame, verses breathed on fire. Across the temple's inner coat, the old man in the bus behind me has the whites of trachoma across his eyes. He closes them and counts the rain. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to welcome uh, Amy Spellman. He's uh, one of our uh, Superior writers, not only a poet, but a prose writer. Uh, he is uh, an author, poet, critic, lecturer. He was a poet in residence at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. He taught various courses in African American uh, culture, offered courses in modern poetry, creative writing, and jazz at Emory, Rutgers, and Harvard universities. Uh, Spellman is an occasional television and radio commentator. He offered reviews and commentaries on National Public Radio, a, a, a program called the Jazz Riffs, uh, including also the NPR Basic Jazz Record Library program. He's a graduate of Howard University, along with uh, people like Lucille Clifton, a National Poet, uh, Poetry Award winner, uh, Amiri Baraka, uh, whom he uh, describes at one point as his, his mentor and one-time uh, collaborator, uh, governors and presidents. Uh, he has published numerous books and articles on the arts, including Art Tatum, whose uh, piano virtuosity is still as yet to be surpassed. Uh, the Beautiful Days, that, which was my introduction to uh, to A.B. Spellman's work. It's now $80 on Amazon. I don't know how much it was. I know it was originally a chapbook. Uh, <clears throat> also, the, the classic uh, work in jazz literature. I think you have to agree with Stanley Krauss that most jazz critics are actually jazz fans. And my description of a, uh, a jazz critic is uh, uh, someone who is engaged in uh, white-collar crime. 
So it's rare to get a uh, jazz critic who knows what he's talking about. His poetry collection, uh, Things I Must Have Known, recently was published by Coffee House Press. Uh, Mr. Spellman has served on numerous arts panels, including the Rockefeller Panel on the Arts, Education in Americans, in Americans, the Awards Panel of the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, ASCAP, uh, the Africa Diaspora Advisory Group, the Jazz Advisory Group, and the Advisory Group on the African American Museum for the Smithsonian Institution. Between 1975 and 2005, uh, A.B. Spellman worked at the National Endowment for the Arts, first as the director of the Expansion Arts program, and for the last decade of his term at the NEA as deputy chairman. In recognition of Spellman's commitment and service to jazz, the National Endowment for the Arts in 2005 named one of its prestigious Jazz Masters Awards, the A.B. Spellman NEA Jazz Masters Award for Jazz Advocacy. Also in 2005, I think I'm, we uh, were in the White House together. That was a uh, celebration of uh, Dizzy Gillespie was there, I call that. Uh, we we uh, went to the White House in 1980 because I figured uh, after that, the only blacks in the White House would be serving drinks I mean, because Reagan was coming in and uh, President Carter was there. And uh, I took my mother and I remember uh, my mother had this old beat up 30 year old Kodak camera. I said, no, we're not gonna go to the White House with that. I got this fancy Italian camera. We're gonna use that and all the pictures turned out dark. But I have one of you I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna send to you because you, you can barely make you out of course. <clears throat> Also in 2005, the Jazz Journalist Association voted to honor Mr. Spellman with its A-Team Award. In March 2006, he received the Benny Golson Award from Howard University. I know you all know Benny Golson, that's uh, Whisper Not, is that correct? Very difficult piece. <clears throat> For his service to jazz, A.B. Spellman is married to the former Karen Edmonds. They have two daughters, Toyin and Oboes, and Kaji, a minister. Mr. Spellman is also the father of Malcolm Spellman, a screenwriter in Los Angeles, California. I met A.B. Spellman in the early 1960s. He had already made a reputation as a writer and would add to that reputation with two books, The Beautiful Days and Four Lives in the Bebop Business, which covered musicians Ornette Coleman, Jack McClain, uh, Cecil Taylor, and Herbert Nichols, Herb Nichols. And I think this was before anybody had heard very much about these musicians. And now they are uh, like household names, at least in Europe, Asia, and Africa, maybe not here. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I think Cecil Taylor was washing dishes at a, at a club. And now there's Cecil Taylor, who's uh, received uh, every award we can think of and collaborated with the, what's that guy's name, Carla Brezhnikov? It was his, the dancer. Yeah, right, yeah. Oh, thanks for helping me out on that. So, uh, so he recognized those, the talent of those people then. <clears throat> but, um, but to call uh, A.B. Spellman a jazz writer is to limit him. Not that jazz is limited, but uh, since he is an African-American poet, it is assumed that his range is limited. In his book, his book, uh, Things I Must Have Known, uh, there are poems that, uh, which uh, uh, are drawn from biblical stories as well as those one finds in West African religion. Uh, there's Bach's uh, keyboard <clears throat> concerto in F minor, which appears in a poem uh, entitled Dear John Coltrane. Gil Evans is here, and so is Mozart. Poems that draw us to scenes from history. James Reese's, uh, James Reese Europe's putting some ragtime in his marches and uh, the abolitionist Sojourner Truth. There are autobiographical poems, love poems, and poems that arise from the narrator's uh, solitude. The poems remind us that A.B. Spellman was among those writers who took advantage of an artistic environment where dancers, musicians, painters, writers, and playwrights collaborated, and as a result, blurred the lines between these arts. To call A.B. Spellman brilliant would be redundant because the poems speak for themselves. His work speaks for itself. For years, people were asking, 
Where is A.B., the poet? Well, here he is, come roaring back like Mickey Rourke. <laughs> A.B. Spellman. I'm going to appropriate this bottle of water. Well, thank you all for coming. You're the best people in the world. People who read poetry and go to readings, and people who write poetry, including Ishmael and me, are the best people there are. And Robert Haas, of course and any other poets in the room, and Nikhail. I particularly want to thank Nikhail for the wonderful reading. Those were, there were some real images of power there. And um, it was a pleasure to hear them. I'd love to read them sometime. They, they were very impressive. I want to acknowledge my first wife and the mother of my son, Danielle over there, and her sister T uh, Tessa, and also Vanessa Wong a colleague from the Arts Endowment. Thanks for coming out. And thank you. I will thank you again in a later poem. First poem I'm going to do is called Groove and Low. The hipsters in the room will recognize this title as a play on the B Dizzy Gillespie bebop tune Groove and High. But whatever Dizzy was talking about in Groove and High, I'm talking about getting older and grooving low. Um, the one thing that uh, I just should let you know is that the weird words in the second stanza are technical terms of the drum. I did not make them up. Grooving low. My swing is more mellow these days, not the hard bop drive I used to roll, but more of a cool foxtrot. My eyes still close when the rhythm locks, I've learned to boogie with my feet on the floor. I'm still moving, still grooving, still falling in love. I bop through the bass line now. The trap set paradiddles, radomacues, and flams that used to spin me in place still set me off. But I bop through the bass line now. I enter the tune from the bottom up and let trumpet and sax wheel above me. So, don't look for me in the treble. <laughs> don't look for me in the fly staccato splatter of the hot young horn, no. You'll find me in the nuance, hanging out in inflection and slur. I'm the one executing the half-bent dip in the slow, slow drag, with the smug little smile and the really cool shades. <laughs> A poem Ish referred to, it's called Dear John Coltrane. I didn't realize until I was in about the 10th or 12th draft that I had stolen half the title from Michael Harper. Um, it's um, a poem that tries to deal with, um, with the experience with the sublime. I think the sublime is, is, is something is, that even few artists even aspire to. Most of us aspire to be good. Some aspire to be great. But very few uh, aspire to achieve that other level. And I think there probably are only four or five artists on the planet at any given time who have it. And I say that because there may be some griot in Senegal or a rock singer in, Af in, in, in India whom I don't know about who has this, this level, but it's very, very rare. So, two musicians who I think achieved that with some regularity were John Coltrane and Sebastian Bach. And so, dear John Coltrane, Dead Night has me writing poetry in another hotel room. J.S. Bach is on the radio the keyboard concerto in F minor, the one you also hear on oboe or violin, or violin. The Largo second movement begins, and the book in my hand drops. The room fades, and I put my reason down to follow the Bach 
of endless line along this earthless path, each note full and bright, a brilliant footprint on the dark. Through beauty, past knowledge, into that state that shines too much to be wisdom, is too transparent to be art. I catch a fear of the place where he will lower me when this transporting melody closes. Then it closes on itself, and here I am, dear John, back at the beginning, better. Later, different station, cold room dimming. It's you, John, trained slow blues. Now it's your line that opens and opens and opens, and I'm flying that way again. Same sky, different moon, this midnight globe that toned those now lost blue rooms where things like jazz float the mind. This view, this motion, the still and airless propulsion I know as inner flight. This view, the one I cannot see with my eyes open. I hear the beginning approach, and I know the line I traveled was a horizon, the circle of the world. Another freedom flight to another starting place. If I believed in heaven, I would ask if you, JC, and Bach ever swap infinite fours and jam the sight that light makes going and coming. And if you exchange maps to those exclusive clouds you travel through, and do you give them names? Now a few love poems, I, I very much love love. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's once said that if you're not in love, you're missing out on the whole thing. And I believe that. The first is daughter love, which is the love where all your defenses go. You love your children in a way that you cannot love anyone else because you absolutely have, again, no defense against them. They are, they are absolutely um, the center of your heart. The poem is called Oriki. Uh, and Oriki is a term from the Yoruba. It is a ceremony that occurs uh, when a child is born. The first sound that it hears is uh, an elder chanting its secret name, this name of power, the one that only the very closest people to it can know, um, and also the lineage of its family. Uh, the ceremony is called the Oriki. It's, um, it's a, the form, however, is Scots, <laughs> or it's actually Welsh, a Welsh form. I got it from, from the Scots poet Kathleen Rain, um, and I pretty much follow it. It's a form where there's a propulsion because you take an, an image or a word from the previous line and you use it in the next line, and it just sort of keeps rolling that way. I pretty much followed it, but not entirely. <clears throat> Into your ear I sing a name. And from that name there runs a line. And on that run, ancestors chant, the elders dance, they build to you. From their mantra, a rose exhales a summer scent to cover you. Within you, there uncoils the line, woman to man, to first made child, to horizons beyond my sight, where settling light enwraps the cold. And in that light, Two hungry souls combine, combine to dream your name. And in their dream, their love makes you. Then from you there combusts a shout. Around that shout there turns a ring. A stomp propounds a jubilee. In jubilee the ancients teach. A people rise, a people fall. We fall and rise and each new hand will sculpt the shape of all the world. You have that force, it fires your smile, it fires your fury, it fires the song I sing to you. That you can be is miracle enough for me. That poem was 25 late years late in coming. <laughs> this was the younger daughter and she never forgave me for having written a poem to the older daughter. But, um, the older daughter's a musician, and it's easy to write poems for musicians. In fact, music is all, music is, is the bones of my, is, of, of my poetry, I, I now realize. This is friend love. I uh, love for, um, all, my, my deepest friends are all women. 
Uh, I have no explanation for this. And I make no excuses for it. Um, I like women. Um, it's called Four Aperceus with Nomic Appendices. Entirely pretentious title. Pearl too it is, uh, because the woman's name is Pearl. She's a friend of mine and my wife's. Um, the, uh, an aperture, of course, is a glance, a uh, glimpse at something, and the gnomic appendices are little sort of uh, tendentious uh, captions that follow each section of the poem. They're, they're, they're in italics, and they just, they're just they sort of like uh, slogans on writing. Pearl is a writer. She's a feminist writer, um, and she taught me whatever feminism I possess. Pearl is, Pearl is frowning into her monitor. The squint of her eyes tells you she is worried, but it's her ear that's got her down. The pitch of her prose is flat. She's drawn her people well enough. They have names, complexions, styles of dress, places to live and go, but their voices are off key. Their lyrics do not sing. They live against their backgrounds and not inside it. Pearl can't admit that the characters she's made have tricked her so cunningly. They've conned her into a trap that she cannot escape, the oblique state of almost life, where her words glance off the real but do not penetrate it. Pearl knows that she should walk away, just back out of these people who refuse to inflame no matter how hard she breathes on them. Oh shit, she sees it now. She's in the wrong person. In first person, now Pearl's bopping hard. She's typed so much her knuckles hurt and her keyboard is blowing tunes. Her people make a sort of rhythm section under her in the way they improvise their lines and moves. The ominous man stirs attention in the flow even when he's not in the room. The older woman keeps them on the one. Eddie, when he enters, will be a tenor saxophone, the tessitura Pearl prefers in her lovers. Then Ava will lean into the mic and croon with him. Their recitative will confect into a ballad of delicate passion and staying close. Writing is living strong in the first person in the revolutionary method of bebop. You make your phrases new. You swing hard through the changes. You break down the blues. Two. Pearl and Zarin are sitting in a gazebo, 40 steps from where high tide has moved the beach. It's pouring down rain, but there are holes in the cloud that let streams of sunlight drizzle through. She is in loose beige diaphragm. Z is shoeless and shirtless in a white linen suit that blackens his mahogany skin. They have a jug of rum and something between them. Pearl is laughing hard. Z is conducting a story with his cigar. It is, of course, a lie, but a true one. As Pearl remonstrates with her balletic hands, a slow wind blowing east picks up their laughter and starts his pelagic journey to the homeland shore. You can't write love if you don't have love. Both parts of this truism are hard to pull off. Three. Pearl is in the kitchen. This is not where she lives. The lairs and pennants that guard her pantry have few duties and must amuse themselves with the creatures of imagination that she and Z emit. But there's this thing she does with chicken breasts and mozzarella that she's proud of and friends will be here soon. It's a housewoman moment she enjoys for now, but do not engrave this image on your memory. Pearl believes no butter and batter can make women strong, and to commit to them would leave her issues intact. She fears the universal sisterhood she wants to forge would etiolate into invisibility if locked inside the home. No, she must take her causes to the page where she can brew them and stew them and serve them up to us. Writing is wanting peace but knowing better. Four. Pearl and Degnan are walking through the West End's winter funk. It's a gray day, but the breeze is soft, the magnolia's fat leaves stubbornly green. 
Degnan is in her last trimester and Dean Bloom is more femme than ever. And to her credit, she remains secure in her beauty, the grand camber of her body now laminated in that lucent skin that glitters fertile women. Pearl is humming Aretha. She has stocked advice for this moment since she carried D and is now about to break it out. But in the way of the young, D thinks herself wise. No matter, Pearl would lay it on her anyway. They smile, I know more than you think smiles to each other. The signature countenance of mother-daughter love, and it is cool. Wisdom, after all, is more for broadcast than for use. Which is writing, music's other voice hummed in the key of C. Writing is where wisdom goes to sing. Cheers. The truth about Karen. Um, I should mention that this, <clears throat> this poem opens talking about my, my wife um, does events. She does festivals, cultural festivals, and other kinds of events for causes that she believes in. And she's really very, very good at that. I could not do it. Once, I remember she put on an event out in LA which had hundreds of thousands of people and it had a thunderstorm and she had to move the whole thing inside in the course of a, mo of a morning, which is a kind of a dilemma that would have put me in the hospital, uh, but she did it. One, another one, she had a festival going on and um, millions of people came to this one because it, it coincided with, with the quilt project. You remember that in, in Washington, D.C. that year. And um, the day before the event, the union that put out the porta parties went on strike. But the city ordinance said you cannot have it without porta potties. Now, for me, I, I, I would have been a nervous wreck. I would not have known what to do with that. But uh, she managed it. She, she coped these things. Anyway, one thing she did was um, Stokely Carmichael, um, Kwame Touré, was the chairman of, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee when she was a member of it. And um, um, she's a fiercely loyal person, my wife. And uh, it, he was dying of cancer, and he wanted to have a, a big encomium for, before, before he died, uh, which would bring the leadership of the civil rights movement together in a unity event. And uh, she arranged this event and, and arranged it very, very successfully. So that's, that's referred to in the beginning here. The truth about Karen. <clears throat> here in the solitude of distance, I see you clearer. You are carrying your mission to the door. This time is Stokely's last painful year you're saving by sculpting a memory of fraternity and revolution he can carry into a champion's death in Africa. Now you're in your garden amid herbs, azaleas, and shrubs. It is not a pristine patch. There are weeds among the blooms. I won't fatten the metaphor of this snapshot, no aesthetic of the imperfect or seeding of blossoms in the urban, etc. It is enough that the theme of your incessant busyness is to find some funky thing and make it better. Even in sleep, you are never still. Beneath that woman is the tender you, the one I breathe with. The passage to her opens to the lightest touch. Her transparency in the nightlight breaks on a soft blown kiss. I know that you better than you. She is far deeper than her moans in the night. She is the love before birthing, the proof of the question, music that makes the darkness live. My love, I am not a weak man, but I could not stand up without your care. When I'm in the bard's disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I call on the fool in me who calls on the fool in you and makes me whole. In the clarity of absence, I know that yours is not a quiet beauty. It compels and has a radiance. We who love you stand inside of and are home. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
This is a poem called The Last of My Time Makes a City. Ish published it on his, on his, in his web magazine. Um, it's, uh, it was written during the last administration. I say that because the word cacistocracy, which was flying around the internet for a while, is in it. And if you don't know that word, it means uh, society ruled in one definition by the worst men and another definition by an idiot. Um, either one works for me. <laughs> um, the Great Dismal Swamp also is mentioned. Uh, the Great Dismal Swamp, that was a swamp. My hometown is Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and it basically is, a, is, a, is part of a drain swamp. And the swamp is called the Great Dismal Swamp, which is a great name for a swamp. <laughs> um, it's a very historic swamp. Um, there's pirate treasure buried all over. Blackbeard had a house up in there one time. And uh, it's where Nat Turner ran away <clears throat> to after his rebellion. So that's referred to as, it's, it's, it's a real swamp. I didn't want to think I was trying to sneak any fake swamps over on you. <laughs> the last of my time makes a city that fills, is filling now with all the music I have ever loved. Sonatas for cellos and congas, for arpeggiones and oboes d'amore, choirs of saxophones, entire symphonies of scat, and arias in languages I've never learned but know the music of. This is where I live. This is how I feed on memory and melody, whose face structures surround me, whose architects have shaped my time. But perhaps I make too much demand of song. Could some other art better compose my summary years? Does the poem reach far enough, spread wide enough? Can I clear the stage of people whom I do not wish to know? Is the eye to be trusted after all that it has seen? Could my last city be well built on canvas, its thoroughfares curving and arcing in perspective up past the smokestacks and bridges where the factions of my years lob color bombs uh, at each other across the boulevard? No and no. My last time is a swinging tune in a minor key in a town built of timbre with lithe ethnic dancers and a hell of a band. Two. I have come so very far and gone nowhere. Memory wearied long ago and now rests with my youth at the start of paths old runaways like Nat Turner wore across the great, great dismal swamp where my hometown floated. Cottonmouth and cohorts of nocturnal forest felons hunted and made it there. So much leaf over the eye and under the foot's loam so alive, each fallen twig bore down roots. Vast orchestras of birds sang of me and other peripatetic tourists of the swamp. The summer sun blinked down its checkerboard patterns according to the whims of breeze and leaf, and I was domiciled with my serenity until the perfidious dark chased me home. My city walk is no less shaded by time and euphony, the birds sing a cappella here, no less the habitat of hunters and prey. I know where the ocean is, can smell it from here, can find the houses where the specters of my loves reside, can shop for melodies of every shade of humankind. Some days my wealth enlarges me, for I own treasures as short as a four-beat praise, phrase, or as long as that string of sixteenth notes that trilled through my head just now. You. I value most of all for the billowing love that let you read this far. Please describe for me the light we met inside of. I, please describe for me the light we met inside of. Did our breath collide? I do not mind that I can't recall the cubist planes of your face, but when you spoke, how was your cadence tempered? What was your favorite word? Three. In Homer's time, they tracked the body's hollows for fumets of the soul. The colon seemed a likely host, which we can understand. But if their excavation yielded one, what would they have done with it? Dyed it green and sealed it in a jar so natural philosophies could worry it to death? 
nagged it for tutorials in metaphysics until the poor thing bled ectoplasm. I have read so much and learned so little. It's not just that age stutters the mind, that I can't recall the sequence of the presidents or where the Peloponnesus is. It's time's obliteration of all those smart ideas that could have cued my life. Knit together, they might have told me how we came to live in this cacistocracy and how to lead us out. How history defies Hegel and adopts the progress of the cottonmouth, fanging and breeding and shedding its odious skin as it slithers along. It's that I can no longer sing on key. So what does it matter if I know 10,000 songs? It's that I can't chant the tribal story like a griot or think my pea green ass out of this goddamn jar. Four, despite or because of all, I remain a man of song. There's a boogie in my blood that palpitates my body in the temple of the present. In the presence of my children who are wiser and more comely than I, my low bass voice projects a dust of summer colors as far as its range will carry. Unlike me, they have such perfect pitch, they do not have to sing to be understood. On the theme of Karen, I blow a mellow blues of owing what I don't know how to pay. My vows swore me to clarify her dreams, pitch a brick into the eye of the cyclops that bars our way, and all I've done is compound a long, confounding puzzle even I have no solution for. So that's the quest I'm off on now. I'll drive till the map runs out, fly till I reverse the globe, spin and spin till I'm dervish enough to improvise a song that's free of every image in this poem. Transcribe that lyric and you'll have my answer. Thank you, thank you. This poem is, I don't know if it works <clears throat> in oral presentations. It's very dense. So you're going to have to pay close attention and just try to see each line on its own merit. It, it, it um, repeats um, words. There's a repetition, re repetition of, of words in there. Uh, but even though they're recycled many times, they're not randomly thrown together in a bag and thrown out on the page. There's um, a precision in, 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 in what, they are, what they are intended to do. Uh, it's, I, I'm coupling this with another poem that goes back over some of the same territory from a different perspective. Uh, I call these two a little night music. Between the night and its shadow is the music. Between the music and the night is the song. Between the song and the music is the voice. Between the voice and the music is the self. Between the self and its song is the mind. Between the mind and the song is the melody. Between the song and its melody is the rhythm. Between the rhythm and the melody is the mind. Between the mind and its song is the word. Between the word and the mind is the voice. Between the voice and the word is the thought. Between the thought and the voice is the self. Between the word and the self is the shadow. Between the shadow and the self is the light. Between the light and the word is the music. The song is the melody in the word and the rhythm. The self holds the mind to the word and the thought of the song. The voice in the song sings the self to the mind. The light lights the shadow of the voice and its melody. The rhythm moves the self through the dimming night song. The thought in the song is of night shadow without music. in lieu of nightingales. This night can't quite be quiet. 
the streets must have their say. The parlous keens of sirens sear my stillness. The wind that whistles in the window frames, the discursive revelries of, from the halfway house next door as the mad folks try to scream their way out of themselves are all more fugues and evening's grotesque lullaby. A faint tremolo inside these Thelonious chords horripilates my spine, tells me that nothing will be where I left it when I awake. The keys to my silence will be lost again in plain sight among the minute crises that escort me from scene to scene. Hang here long enough and it all congeals into a queer presence, doesn't it? A sad little bovine melancholy that is the Merc City's salient demon. I swim up and look down for a moment upon the singular village that human darkness is, even without the unfathomable nirvana that dreams claim to carry. What's to be seen inside its mythic stillness? The clanging paradox that silence inhabited is not silence. Stillness with me in it is never still. Night is the ear's domain. Night's voice is the shadow that shadows cast, imperfect and out of tune, like the rest of us. Well, let me lighten it up a bit. Um, some old friends of Issues and Danielle's and, I, and mine um, have written tell-all books. I do, not in, I do not understand this imperative at all. I remember pleading with one woman to leave me out of her book, <laughs> uh, saying we had a brief casual thing 50 years ago. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's nice of you to remember, but we did not make history. <laughs> so, um, but no, there you are anyway. So. Um, so I decided I would write the untell-all poem. It's called The Women I Have Not Slept With. <laughs> they number in the trillions. <laughs> and that's if I only count the living. For example, I have not slept with Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> and not because of her Iron Maiden cognomen, no. I perceive a certain low simmer there. I have not slept with her because she's too far right, and I'm too far left, and there's too much miscegenation to arouse. <laughs> Nor have I slept with that woman, Monica Lewinsky, or Hillary Clinton. Though I did have a shot with Hillary, and I have a photograph to prove it. That's me shaking hands with her, my head cocked to the side, a mating signal in every mammal male, and I think I saw something in the curl of her mouth, but I couldn't make my move there in the gold room with the line pushing at my back. But we'll see, we'll see. I have not slept with Madonna. Before you get the impression that I've only not slept with white women, I have not slept with Oprah either. No fault of hers, no fault of mine, we just never hooked up. Never made it with Vanessa Williams, and that one hurts. <laughs> she split on me in a sexual fantasy. Took one look at my admittedly adipose body and disappeared <laughs> from my fantasy and wouldn't come back. Broke my tumescent heart. And then there's Shaka Khan. Sweet, sweet, sweet Shaka, the lust of my life. I did get to hug her once but my boss was in the room and nothing came of it. She sent me a box of chocolates. <laughs> and so it goes, or it doesn't. If I haven't slept with you and haven't mentioned you, please don't be offended. I'm not the kind of guy to not kiss and tell, and besides, I thought you deserved your own poem. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Whatever you want. Whatever I want. Okay, good people. Um, I, I, okay, um, I'll just read a couple more. 
I think I've been here a pretty good while. Um, well, we elected Barack Obama this last time, which was a great and good thing. I mean, the alternatives. Uh, we could have had Vice President Palin. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, somebody, there must be Sarah Palin poems out there somewhere, aren't there? I bet you could do that Sarah Palin anthology. I, there must be Sarah Palin poems. All right, all about, all, all about women, though, please. Uh, all right. Uh, but, but, um, but seriously, folks, as the comedians say, um, there was a long time, a, a lot of struggle into getting to this point. And uh, I, I remember, I'm reminded of uh, back in the mid-60s. This point was about 1968, I believe, uh, when we thought we were making a revolution. We weren't making a revolution, and we broke some things that needed breaking, and we made some things that needed making, but we certainly didn't come anywhere near a revolution. But anyway, that's what, that's what we thought we were trying to do, and I uh, wrote this particular poem. Uh, I should just mention the glosses uh, that, um, I guess there are people in the room who are too young to know who Walter Cronkite is. Um, so he was the CBS newsman um, and very well-respected journalist. Um, the ne other names in here are all workers from from civil rights movement, um, mostly from Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Orangeburg, that's uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina, where South Carolina State College is. Uh, everybody knows about the horrible killings at Kent State uh, when students in peaceful demonstration were shot down by state troopers. But a lot, most people don't know that there's several historically black colleges at the same time that that, that occurred, in at least five or six instances. Uh, and our, South Carolina State was one where the same thing went down. So, um, when black people are with each other, we sometimes fear ourselves, whisper over our shoulders about unmentionable acts, and sometimes we fight and lie. These are some things we sometimes do. And when alone, I sometimes walk from wall to wall, fighting visions of white men fighting me, and black men fighting white men and fighting me. And I lose myself between walls and ricocheting shots and can't say for certain who I have killed or been killed by. It is the fear of winter passing and summer coming and the killing I have called for coming to my door saying, hit it, A.B., you're in it too. And the white army moves like thieves in the night, mass producing beautiful black corpses and then stealing them away. While my frequent death watches me from Orangeburg on Cronkite. And I'm oiling my gun and cooking my food and saying, when the time comes to myself, over and over, hopefully. But I remember driving from Atlanta to Birmingham with Stone and Featherstone and Cleve. And Feather talked about dueling a pair of Klansmen. And Cleve told how they hunted Cheney's, Schwerner's, and Goodman's bodies in the haunted hours of the silver nights in the Mississippi swamp while a runaway survivor from Orangeburg slept between wars on the back seat. Times like this are times when black people are with each other and the strength flows back and forth between us like borrowed breath. And I will conclude with my funeral poem. It's called After Vallejo. It would help probably to get all the references if you knew something about Afro-Cuban culture, but there's too much of that to explain in here, so, um, so I'll leave it be. I, I assume that many of you will know that the Orisha are demigods of the Santeria faith um, religion. Um, often, they, often they coincide with the saints of the Catholic Church um, because the Africans, when they were introduced to Catholicism, um, looked at the saints and said, yeah, we recognize that. We know, we know what, that, what that is. We, 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 have, we have that person in our religion, too. Uh, after Vallejo, the great Peruvian poet Cesar Vallejo, <clears throat> whom, I, whom I hope that most of you will know. I will die in Havana in a hurricane. It will be morning. I'll be facing southwest. 
away from the gulf, away from the storm, away from home, looking to the varied hills of Matanzas where the Orisha rise, lifted by bongueros and masks of iron, bongoceros and masks of water, timbaleros and masks of fire, by all the clave that binds the rhythms of this world. I'll be writing when I go, revising another hopeful survey of my life. I will die of nothing that I did, but of all that I did not do. I promised myself a better self than I could make, and I will not forgive. You will be there complaining that I never saved you, that I left you where you live, stranded in your own green dream. When you come for me, come singing. No dirge, but scat my eulogy in bebop code. Sing that I died among gods, but lived with no god and did not suffer for it. Find one true poem that I made and sing it to my shade as it fades into the wind. Sing it presto, in 4-4 four, four time, in the universal ghetto key of B flat. I will die in Havana in rhythm. Tumbayo, Montuño, Guaguanco, dense strata of rhythm pulsing me away. And the mother of waters will say to the saint of crossroads, well, damn. He danced his way out after all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Behind the flowers. Looks like we lost the power. Are you still on back there? Maybe something happened. Does anybody have any questions? Look at, look at, look at. Yes. In one of the poems you called writing music's other voice. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the rhythms that you find yourself working in again and again in the poems. I, I heard a lot of iambics. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it comes that way. Um, I think that, um, um, first of all, I spend a lot of time in music. I, sp I spend a lot of time in music. It's, um, I, I, I can't, I can't get away from it in my poems. Sometimes I'd say, well, maybe maybe you should stop writing poems that refer to music or that have uh, that use music as metaphor. I mean, I, I, there's music as a metaphor for death, for love. Uh, it's, uh, music is a structure of the poem. Uh, the last of my time makes a city. Uh, it, it holds together through means of musical references. Um, but then I say, why? You know. Um, so I think that, I think that all the attention to music that I give in my daily life informs uh, the, the, the cadences of the poems. I don't go about it that way, but I, I think that um, even lines which are without any defined form have to scan in some sense of the word. You know, the they, 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 they line has to, has to ha have a meter and the meter has to come out right. Um, so um, that does not imply in any way that, it, that how it comes out is predetermined uh, by any kind of scale, but it has to be there. The line has to feel right to me according to its own metrics. Um, so that's how I go about it. I don't have, uh, I don't have any manifesto on it. I, I don't have any manifesto at all uh, in poetry. I just try to make them work. Uh, but that's, I know that's an element of, of my style. Somebody who is not a faculty member. 